this. Here's another question. Do you think that the left forces conservatives to have so completely defend certain positions that they may not necessarily look critically at such positions? Take capitalism. Do we reflexively defend capitalism without analyzing it with a critical eye? Now I know that was an example, an off the top of the head example, but we don't have to analyze critic. Uh, we don't have to analyze capitalism. You know, capitalism analyzes itself. Uh, capitalism, if if unfettered, if left alone, capitalism is the single greatest source of intelligence that we've ever known because capitalism or and again you know there's funny when you find the history of these things you find out how, how how even we who I consider all of us watching this to be you know conservative warriors even we've been duped by these people and been told to what to say the term capitalism apparently came from Karl Marx who wanted to find a term for private property that he found uh, you know that he could demonize. And in other words, in order to be successful in the system, you had to be, you know, you had to be um, Mr. Moneybags from um, Monopoly. You had to be a fat guy with a top hat carrying around big sacks that had dollar signs on them. That's what you had to be in order to be a capitalist, and everybody else was just working for him and slaving away. Free markets, basically, the, just the free market, the idea that you've got something that I want and I've got something that you want, is the, the biggest single source of intelligence in the history of the world. And the reason I say that is, is, is because there are 300 million people just in this country uh, who are making decisions of, they're very simple decisions, but when you think about the web of them, each, just each individual person's web, they're fantastically complex. You make a decision about how much car you can afford and how much luxury you can afford, what you can afford to pay. You make decisions about what kind of um, auto insurance you have for the car. You make a decision about the house. Sometimes you over you, you overcommit yourself and you're on the rails and sometimes if you're disciplined and you're one in a thousand you save money and you, you know, use that wisely and but we all make decisions and uh, pg o'rourke who i keep I, I wish i could meet him or at least interview him after 12 years you think i would have had a chance because he has such an effect on me one of the many 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 brilliant things that he pointed out to me was uh, was about the stock market and he said well first of all he said something that most people just simply don't even think about just never enters their head and that is during a, a financial meltdown when everybody's selling their stocks, PJ pointed out something that's so obvious that I didn't see it. Namely, for every person that sells a stock, somebody's buying. Somebody's buying that stock. And the people that are buying the stock are the people that don't panic. If you've got a stock that's worth $100 and the market crashes and now the stock's worth $1 and you sell it at $1, then you've lost 99% of the value. But if the stock was worth $100 and it goes to $1 and you hang on to it, and then the stock goes back up to 80 or 90 or 100 or 150 in the next 15 or 20 years. You haven't lost anything. So that is, is an interesting insight. But basically the point I was trying to make here is P.G. O'Rourke said if you think about the, the, um, the, the floor of the um, New York Stock Exchange, people trying to understand how all this trading works and all this other stuff. He said the way to think of that is this. Let's say you wanted to buy a 2016 Camaro which are very nice, by the way. Uh, the 2012s were, the 2010 went all the way up to 2015. They redesigned them in 2016 uh, with some tweaks in between. So let's say you want to buy a 2016 Camaro. What P.J. O'Rourke said is the, the power of the free market to decide costs is very simple. He said, imagine that you had every single buyer who was interested in buying an a 2016 Camaro and every single person who sold Camaros and all of them were in the same room he said you would find out the price of that car within 20 seconds probably and that really clarified things for me because what what the market is doing is the market is basically saying what what are people willing to pay they don't want to pay anything they'd rather pay a dollar for the car right but the but the dealer has to make money. He, his car costs a certain amount of money. He has to make that back. He has to make enough profit to run the business and pay his employees. Plus, he has to make enough profit to presumably put some of it away. So he's going to figure out what that car costs. And he will, the dealer now will have a point below which he cannot go. He simply cannot go. He will, he will lose money on the deal. But he'd love to go way above that because that's what the seller wants. He'd love to you know, make you buy a $30,000 car for $40,000. Hooray! So whatever the number is, let's just say it's 30 grand. If you have all the buyers in one place and all the sellers in one place, you're going to get to 30 grand right away because 
you are going to find out that I want to pay 30 grand and a, and a dealer will have it for sale for 45 grand. So you're out of your mind. And then you'll, you'll find somebody selling it for 36 and you'll find all these people that are selling it and you'll get to 30 grand and you won't find anybody below 30 grand because 30 grand is the smallest amount that somebody can sell a car for and still survive. So it's not that hard. And once I realized what he was saying, I realized, that, well, of course, it's how the stock market works. I just, I just didn't have anybody explain it to me in such a concise way. All of the buyers and all of the sellers through their representatives are in one place, and you will get to an absolutely instantaneous view of what the value of whatever it is you're, you're trying to sell. And the reason I bring this up is because you can pretend and you can legislate prices to be different than the Camaro example I gave. You can legislate, you can have a law that says that it is a, it is a right of people. Put another amendment in the Constitution. Say you have a constitutional right to a 2016 Camaro and that your constitutional right says you can't pay more than $10,000 for the car. You can you can do that. You can also conceivably could write legislation that says that uh, a, a 2000 Camaro cannot be sold for less than $50,000. So let's just say you did that. Price is 30 and, and one law says, no, you must, you can't pay more than $10,000, that's the law, or you must charge more than $50,000, that's the law. What happens when you start fooling around like this? Well, if you say that the car has to be sold for $10,000 or less, it's my, it's my right as an American, and the car costs 20 to build, 24 to build, then they're not going to make any more 2016 Camaros. They just simply will not make them. They can't. They can't. It's not worth the raw materials. They simply cannot do it. So the car goes away, and all the wealth goes away, and all the fun goes away, and all that stuff goes away. So if you, if you artificially set a price too low, then the commodity or the goods in question or the services will dry up because it's not worth doing. Conversely, if you set the price so high, you might sell seven uh, 2016 Camaros at half again more or twice what they're actually worth, or maybe sell more than that. But you wouldn't sell as many as you could. And the one thing that's always fascinated me, it's really fascinated me, and I know there are people that are experts in this, but it, it, it's the kind of thing that you never really think about until you do, and then when you do, it's like, holy cow. And that is that every product in the world, including BillWhittle.com memberships, including uh, the cameras that we're talking about now, the Apple computers that we're working, everything, including people's wages, Everything has a sweet spot, and the sweet spot is the point at which um, the graph. Uh, if, if you're gonna, if you're, if you're, um, your cost is in the vertical. The higher you go, the more it costs, and then to the to the right, the more you sell. You're gonna sell lots and lots of things if they're very cheap. You're gonna sell very very few things if they're very expensive, and every single product has arrived at the sweet spot where if you raise the price on a pair of Nikes you would make more money per pair but you wouldn't sell as many pairs so if you raise the price of Nikes that will reduce your total income likewise if you lower the price on Nikes you'll sell more of them but you won't make as much per box of shoes and that will lower the income and all of these products find that magical um, that magical sweet spot where they they have figured out just through the market that this is the way to maximize our income if we charge more than this we'll sell fewer we'll make more money but we'll sell fewer which means net loss if we start charge less than this we'll sell more but we'll get less per item which means net loss They're right at the sweet spot I, and how they find that out is absolutely fascinating it's absolutely incredible they, it, it, it finds itself so um i know there's a lot on capitalism there uh, max when you're really just asking us about defending positions that we uh, may not necessarily look critically at the only thing I have to say about that is I have found myself occasionally reflexively defending things that I didn't feel like I should be defending simply because the left is using it as a bludgeon to get more of our money and power and all the rest of it. One example I remember pretty well was from uh, a trifecta show we did. And it, the show was about, the ep individual episode was about a kid who was uh, on a, I think he was on a college track team, might have been a high school track team. And he is running the race, and some kid falls down, and this guy stops and goes back and helps the kid up, and they cross the finish line together. This kid was winning and would have won the race. It was like way out in front. So he stops, 
he goes back, he picks up the kid, his, you know, from a different school, who's hurt himself, and arm and arm around each other, off they go, and they cross the finish line dead last. And a lot of conservatives came out against that. They came out pretty violently against it in our comment section. You, you know, this kid's an idiot. You know, he doesn't owe these people anything. You know, self-interest, enlightened self-interest is good for everybody. And all the rest of this Ayn Rand stuff and all the rest of this invisible hand stuff and all this stuff makes sense. It does. It absolutely does. But when you demonize, when, when you've been using help thy neighbor as thyself to take everything from you, so to the point where acts of actual charity and virtue are suspect, then you got to stop and you got to got to roll down the windows. What that guy did was was a tremendously honorable thing and a good thing and a, and a noble thing. The difference is very simple, and the difference is he decided that he wanted to sacrifice his own winning medal, and on his own volition, without coercion, he made a moral decision that he would rather help this person than come in first place. And that is fundamentally different, it's diametrically opposed to the idea that somebody is forcing him to go back and help that guy, forcing him to give up the win and go back and help the guy. But we get so, we get so um, defensive, and rightfully so. We're defensive all the time because we're under attack all the time. We're trying to conserve this beautiful, wonderful thing on Independence Day. We're trying to conserve this freedom thing. And I, ta I thought about this getting dressed today. It's like, hey, you know, we're going to have Independence Day coming up. We'll talk about freedom. It's like kids don't understand. They, they think you're nuts when you talk about freedom. And they think you're nuts in the same way if you went around talking about how all of the electricity was going to fail. They, they, they would say, electricity can't fail. What do you mean you can't be free? Of course you're free. We're always going to be free. We don't need to defend freedom. We don't need to fight for it. We certainly don't need to work for it. That's all we've ever known. It's all our parents have ever known. And it's all their parents have ever known. You won't know it until it's taken away. And then it'll be too late. So, yes, I do know what you mean, Max. Sometimes we do get a little backed into a corner. And and I've seen it. I've seen, uh, oh, my God, they're sneaking around again. Look at this. It's like some kind of infestation. We better get the, um, we need to get the uh, pest control people in here. There's all kinds of things moving around in the background on the shot. I'm seeing all kinds of, she's looking at me like she's ser like I'm serious. She's, it was a joke. It was a joke. I saw you go through the frame and I said we need oh. to get some, 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 some pest control in here. Um, here she, she's coming. Everybody, she's this is the best boss ever. I know you all love him, but I love him more. Aren't you sweet? <laughs> That raise is not going to happen, by the way. Try though you may. That was a nice thing to say. Thank you. Um, so uh, there we go. I don't remember what I was talking about anymore, but it was it had to do with the whole the whole thing. Look, there she is. Um, all right, let's move on here.